Interstate 94 is a freeway that runs through St. Paul and Minneapolis. It makes it easy to get between the two cities by driving, but it hasn't always been this way. I-94 replaced a street called Rondo Avenue, the heart of a neighborhood that was home to hundreds of African Americans. Rondo was a great community. It was remembered for being very safe. You could leave the doors unlocked, both homes and businesses, and not worry about a thing. It was a good place to raise a family, have a business, and just live. The building of Interstate 94 was a conflict for the people of Rondo, and this led to the greater conflict of where the African Americans could move once they lost their homes, a question with no real compromise. At the end of World War II, the economy went back to normal, and people were suddenly able to afford more things. One of the big things people bought were cars. With the increasing number of cars, more freeways were planned all over the country. One of the freeways needed was one that goes through St. Paul and Minneapolis, Interstate 94. Around the same time, Rondo Avenue and the surrounding streets were the largest African-American neighborhood in St. Paul. It was a typical small community where everybody knew each other. There were nearly 30,000 people in the area, and about one-third were black. But Italians, Jews, Native Americans, and many other ethnicities lived there too. We all knew each other and we all got along. We went to school together. We worshipped together, most of us. We did a lot of the things in the neighborhood together. It was a place where you knew who you were, you knew where you came from, and you knew where you were going. But nobody knew where they were going after the news was passed around in 1953. It started with a school in Rondo that needed remodeling, but the neighborhood was told it would be easier just to relocate because a freeway was going to be built there anyway. Through word of mouth from the small community, the story spread. Interstate 94 was going to be built, and Rondo Avenue was right in its way. People were worried, angry, and scared. Did I-94 have to go through Rondo? Some say no. Another route I-94 could have taken was farther north in the city, near Minnehaha Avenue, which is now called the Pierce-Butler Route. At the time, highway engineers, who worked for the Minnesota Highway Department, would go out to the road with stopwatches and bring accountants to count the cars. They would chart and map the information they got to determine the best place to build a highway. And their numbers showed that Rondo was the most direct route. Out there, you know, clicking the number of cars and keeping careful track and doing desire lines and figuring out where people wanted to go. The process that they went through would seem to suggest that race had nothing to do with it. But that's only one. Another reason Rondo was chosen was to clear the slums from the area. A letter was written to the St. Paul Pioneer Press on February 9, 1993, by one of the planners who claimed this was an important reason for picking the Rondo route. Parts of the neighborhood could be considered a slum district, meaning that the land there was owned by landlords who didn't live in the neighborhood, and the lower class African Americans there were restricted to that area. But a lot of Rondo was middle class, and many African Americans owned their own houses and property. Finally, political and business leaders thought putting a highway there would bring more business to downtown St. Paul. When it became clear that Interstate 94 was definitely being built through Rondo, some of the residents tried refusing to leave. But nobody believed it was actually possible to stop the highway. Because it was the 1950s, citizen action was not a well-known tactic. This was before many of the widely publicized events of the Civil Rights Movement, such as the March on Birmingham and other protests for equality as inspiration. As far as the people of Rondo saw it, the highway was unstoppable, but the community hoped their protest could help them achieve four compromises. The first compromise was that when the highway was built, they could stay in their houses as long as possible so that their houses weren't vacant for very long before they were destroyed. Second, they wanted to get fair market value for their houses. Third, they wanted the freeway to be depressed below the street instead of elevated above it so they could have bridges over it at street level. They thought this way the community wouldn't be completely severed. All three of these compromises were accepted with some success, but the fourth compromise, the most important one, was denied. 
The African Americans in Rondo wanted an open housing law so that they could buy any house anywhere in the state that they could afford. At the time, it was legal in Minnesota to have discriminatory housing. It wasn't until 1963 that a national law was passed making it illegal to discriminate against anyone on the basis of race. Before that, not just anyone could buy property anywhere they could afford it. If property owners decided they didn't want to sell a house to an African American or any other ethnicity, it was perfectly legal. In the later years of the 1950s, the people of Rondo asked the city council many times to pass an open housing law in St. Paul, but they were delayed and put off. Finally, the city attorney wrote an opinion that said the state's constitution didn't allow the city to act. The city law was never passed. Since the African Americans were denied open housing legislation by the city council, finding homes was difficult when the interstate started building through Rondo. I can remember we looked at one house that was a block past Lexington, across the street from Central High School. We went in and the people were nice. We decided that we liked the house, but come to find out later that we couldn't move. We couldn't even move a block past Lexington because Lexington was the color boundary. I remember when people started moving out and the loneliness of that. They would bring these big balls, these big huge destruction balls, and they would hit the house. They hit it several times before it gave way. It was horrendous to watch. I remember the quietness when everybody was gone. It was hard to move, and it was hard to be left behind. In 1962, when the demolition work was finished, one out of every seven black houses had been removed, and 90% of the businesses. Interstate 94 really did its job of breaking up the community. Though the highway planners showed pictures of nice bridges that joined the community over the highway, in reality, the bridges they built were ugly. They were long, narrow, infrequent, and over a roaring highway. They didn't connect the community very well. And while sources agreed that most people got fair prices for their homes, others, such as the owners of the Rang Court Housing Co-op, did not. Everybody scattered when Rondo was destroyed, but most had nowhere to go far beyond the community because there was no open housing legislation. Of the 2,900 St. Paul families that were displaced, about 400 of them were black. This was about one-fifth of the black population in St. Paul. The majority of the families were already poor and were left in worse conditions than they had been in before. The neighborhood businesses either had to move because they were in the way of the freeway or close from lack of customers. The edges of the neighborhood crept outward while the heart of it was destroyed. What does Rondo teach us about our state and racism in the 1950s? While it wasn't uncommon to build freeways connecting white business districts through the heart of black communities then, only 20% of the families displaced were black. It was a decision about class. Would a street like Summit Avenue, the longest street of Victorian houses in the U.S., have been destroyed to build a freeway? Probably not. But something that can't be denied is that Interstate 94 took so many things away from the Rondo neighborhood for the sake of cars and people moving faster. There was so much more destroyed than just homes. When they took Rondo away, they took away my dream. I know that a lot of us had dreams that were connected to Rondo in a way. If you could tie all these little dreams together and somehow you could hold them, all of them together, then it creates a vision for the whole community. These little dreams added together could have resulted in the rebirth of our community, a pride in our community. I think the destruction of Rondo destroyed futures, and it did not have to be that way. That's the greatest crime of Rondo, and that's what Rondo's destruction means to me.